the economic convulsions that racked Western societies between the two world wars were seen at the time by most Marxists as being the breakdown of the capitalist system which Marxist theory had always predicted. However, whereas according to the theory this was supposed to lead to communism, in not one single such Western society did communist regimes emerge. What did emerge in several of them was fascism. Some Marxists were disillusioned by this to the point of abandoning Marxism. Others refused to question Marxist theory regardless of what actually happened. But there were many in between, people who remained or wanted to remain Marxists, but who felt that Marxism would have to be seriously re-examined if it was to continue to remain credible. One such group of people came together in Frankfurt in the late 1920s and have come to be known since as the Frankfurt School. Actually, they didn't stay in Frankfurt long, but the name has stuck. They left Germany in the early 1930s, in the period just before and after the Nazis came to power, and by the mid-30s, the key figures had all settled in the United States. These, to mention three, were Adorno, a man who seemed equally at home in philosophy, sociology, and music, Horkheimer, a philosopher-cum-sociologist, less brilliant than Adorno, but perhaps more solid, and the one who has turned out in the end to be the most famous and influential of them all, the political theorist Herbert Marcuse. Their influence grew slowly but grew nevertheless over a long period and reached a spectacular peak in the 1960s. Many things contributed to this. One was the powerful revisionist movement among Marxist in communist countries throughout Eastern Europe, culminating in the Prague Spring of 1968. This put the Frankfurt School in line for the first time with real-life developments inside the communist world. Another, obviously related, was the tremendous revival of interest in Marxism among people in the West, especially educated young people. This also culminated in 1968, the year which saw the high point of student violence all over Europe and the United States, and looked for a moment in Paris as if it might even come close to genuine revolution. The would-be revolutionaries of that day proclaimed one man more than others as their political mentor, and that was Marcuse. They painted the walls with phrases from his books in order to make it known to the world that they were going to turn his ideas into reality. And although the revolution didn't materialize, during the decade since then, the ideas of Marcuse and the Frankfurt School have come to dominate some of the social science departments in various countries in Europe, and through them to have a continued and very important influence on the young. Professor Marcuse, why should it have been to your writings that the revolutionary student movements of the 1960s and early 70s turned? Well, I was not the mentor of the student activists of the 60s and early 70s. What I did is uh, formulate and articulate uh, some ideas and some goals uh, that were in the air at uh, that time. That is about it. The uh, student generation that became active in these years did not need a father figure or a grandfather figure in order to lead them to protest against a society which revealed daily its uh, inequality, injustice, cruelty, and its uh, general destructiveness. They could experience it. They saw it before their own eyes. As features of the society, I only mention uh, the heritage of fascism. Fascism was militarily defeated. The potential for a repetition was still there. I would like to mention racism, uh, sexism, the uh, general insecurity, the uh, pollution of the environment, the degradation of education, the degradation of work, and so on and so on. In other words, what exploded in the 60s and early 70s was a blatant contrast between the tremendous available social wealth and its uh, miserable, destructive, and wasteful use. And I think one might add, I mean, whether one agrees with your view on any or all of these matters or not, 
that the prevailing orthodoxies in philosophy in the colleges and universities throughout the West at this time simply didn't deal with these questions at all, did they? Certainly analytic philosophy didn't, uh, positivism didn't, and so they on. They did not. And we uh, in Frankfurt and later in the United States could not, cost, uh, could not conceive of any authentic philosophy which did not in one way or the other reflect the human condition in its concrete situation, the social and political uh, situation, and so on and so on. Uh, for us, philosophy has always been, to a great extent, social and political philosophy ever since Plato. Yeah. Of course, philosophy has been of enormous importance to you throughout your life. In fact, yes. you've spent your life as a university teacher, lecturer, academic, writer of books, and so on. Mm -hmm. But one of the conspicuous features of the new left movement that you have helped to father is its anti-intellectualism. Now, from the way you've lived your life, one wouldn't expect you actually to approve of that. On the contrary, I combated this anti-intellectualism from the beginning. The reason for this anti-intellectualism are, in my view, uh, the isolation of the student movement from the working class and the apparent impossibility of any spectacular political action. This led gradually to some kind of, well, uh, let me say inferiority complex, some kind of uh, self-inflicted masochism, uh, which found expression, among other things, in this contempt for intellectuals because they are only intellectuals and don't achieve anything in reality. I must say it's a unique interest to hear uh, criticisms of the new left from you of all people. While we're on this subject, what other important defects do you think that the new left movement has developed as it has uh, gone along? Well, I would mention perhaps as a main uh, defect the uh, unrealistic language and in many cases the totally unrealistic strategy uh, among the new left, by no means general, but very definitely uh, among the new left. The refusal uh, to recognize that we are not in a revolutionary situation in the advanced industrial countries, that we are not even in a pre-revolutionary situation, and that the strategy has to be uh, adapted to this uh, situation. Secondly, among the new left, again, that does by no means refer to all of the groups, among the new left, the refusal to re-examine and uh, to develop Marxian categories, to make a, a fetish out of Marxist theory, to uh, treat uh, the uh, Marxian concepts as reified, uh, objectified categories in, in order, uh, instead of uh, becoming conscious finally of the fact that these are historical and dialectical concepts which cannot simply be transmitted, which has to be which have to be re examined in accordance with the changes in the society itself. I must say it's enormously refreshing to hear these words from your lips. I mean, it, it shows that, that you are still thinking afresh when people who regard themselves as followers of yours and are young enough to be your grandchildren uh, have, I have, 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 stopped, have stopped thinking in some cases. But now you've, you've brought us to what was really the, uh, the guts of, of the Frankfurt School itself as it started, when you started talking about the re-examination of Marxist concepts. As I said in my introduction to this program, it was the feeling that Marxism had to be re-examined and reconstructed that gave rise to your movement, uh, particularly as a result of fascism. But fascism wasn't the only thing that precipitated it, was it? I mean, there were other political factors too. Can you comment on what some of them were? The, uh, you mean some of the factors which demanded a revaluation of Marxian yes. uh, categories? Yes. Uh, to me, one of the most important ones concerns the concept of socialism itself. Uh, in the development of Marxian theory, not in Marx uh, himself, but in the development of his uh, theory, uh, socialism has become, uh, the concept has uh, entirely, almost entirely been focused on a more rational, uh, larger, development of the productive forces. 
on a never higher productivity of labor, on a more rational distribution of the project, instead of stressing that a socialist society, as Marx envisaged it, at least the younger Marx envisaged it, was a society qualitatively different from all preceding societies. Now, in what way qualitatively different? Uh, the main point, I would say, is uh, for Marx, a genuine socialist society was a society in which the quality of life was decidedly different from the existing societies. Meaning, in a gen genuine socialist society, labor, full-time alienated labor, would no longer be the measure of wealth and value. In an authentic socialist society, uh, men and women could live their life without fear, without being compelled to spend their entirely adult existence in alienated performances. This image has been obscured and the result was some kind of frightening continuity between the developed and advanced capitalist societies and the image of a socialist society. Yes, socialism began to become like its enemy, so to speak. Exactly. I know from your writings that you had other very central criticisms of Marxist theory, two that I would like to mention, partly because they're probably connected in your mind, is that you regarded Marxism as anti-libertarian, or at least insufficiently libertarian, as, as the Marxist tradition developed, and you also thought that it didn't take sufficient account of the individual. Now, it would be very interesting to hear you comment on those two points. Marx did not concern himself very much with the individual, and he didn't have to, because at his time, uh, the very existence of the uh, proletariat uh, made this class a potentially revolutionary class. Now, things have changed considerably since. Uh, you know the question is, uh, to what extent uh, can uh, the present working class in the advanced industrial countries still be called a proletariat? The Western European countries have abandoned this concept uh, altogether. Now, what has taken place is uh, a large-scale integration of perhaps the majority of the population into the existing capitalist system. The organized working class, at least, no longer has nothing to lose but its chains, but a lot more. And this, in uh, turn, took place not only on a material, but also on a psychological basis. The consciousness of uh, the uh, dependent population uh, changed. It was uh, one of the most striking phenomena to see to what extent the ruling uh, power structure, structure could manipulate, manage, and control not only the consciousness, but also the subconscious and unconscious of the uh, individuals. Therefore, uh, at uh, my friends at the Frankfurt School, considered psychology uh, one of the main uh, branches of knowledge that had to be uh, integrated with Marxian theory. By no means replacing Marxian theory, but uh, taking it into Marxian theory. You yourself have done a lot in your writings to try to marry Freudianism and Marxism. And I think that uh, uh, some people would say that this simply can't be done. Um, because the two patterns of explanation are incompatible with each other. I mean, to put it extremely briefly, uh, Marxist theory locates the ultimate level of explanation of human affairs in technique. Uh, the theory, put very simply, is that the uh, level of development of the means of production in a society at any given time determine the formation of classes in that society and that in turn determines the relationships of individuals to each other and on that basis grow up what Marxists call the superstructure of ideologies, religions, philosophy, mm -hmm. art and so on. 
Now, according to Freud, something entirely different is the ultimate explanation of human behavior. The ultimate explanation, according to him, lies in the repressed uh, contents of the unconscious, our, our unconscious wishes, fantasies, fears, feelings, and so on, uh, which are repressed as a result of, of uh, distortions in our earliest relationships, above all with our parents. And he explains uh, not only social behavior, but also ideologies, art, religion, and so on, in terms of the externalization of the, of the repressed contents of the psyche. Now, these are two entirely different kinds of explanation of the same set of phenomena. How can you possibly marry the two into a single theory? I think they can easily be married and it may well be a very happy marriage. I think they are two extremely different interpretations of two different levels of the same whole, the same uh, totality. The uh, primary drives the unconscious primary drive, which Freud stipulated, namely uh, erotic energy and destructive energy, eros and thanatos, develop within a specific given social framework, which in one way or the other regulates the manifestation of these primary drives. Now, the social impact goes even further than that. According to Freud, the more intense the repression in a society, the more what happened is a mobilization of surplus aggressiveness against this repression. Now, since, again, according to Freud, repression is bound to increase with the progress of civilization, at the same time and parallel to it, aggressive energy, surplus aggressiveness, is going to be mobilized and is going to be released. In other words, with the progress of civilization, we will have a progress in uh, destructiveness. And it seems to me no hypothesis can better explain what happens today than that one. I think it will, the thought will occur, the following thought will occur to some people listening to our discussion up to this point. You have catalogued a very formidable uh, list of defects in Marxist theory and prediction. A failure to predict the future success of capitalism, uh, the uh, anti-libertarian element in Marxism, uh, the absence of any theory or attitude to the individual. You've also talked about other entirely new theories like Freudianism, which came on the scene after Marx and therefore couldn't have been accommodated mm -hmm. by Marx in his outlook. A lot of people will say, well, since you were so conscious of this enormous range of defects in Marxism, why did you want to remain Marxists? I mean, why, why try to hang on to a, a, a discredited or... Or, or falsified theory? Why not try to liberate your thought categories from that altogether and actually look at reality afresh? Easy answer, because I do not believe that the theory as such has been falsified. What has happened is that uh, some of the concepts of Marxian theory, as I said before, uh, will have to be re-examined but this is not something from outside brought into Marxist theory. That is something Marxist theory itself, as a historical theory, demands. Now, uh, it is relatively easy for me to uh, enumerate, to give you a catalog of the decisive uh, concepts of Marx which have been corroborated in the development of capitalism. The concentration of economic power the fusion of economic and political power, the increasing intervention of the state into the economy, the increasing difficulties in uh, stemming the tendential the decline in the rate of profit, the need for engaging in a neo-imperialism in order to uh, create markets and possibilities of enlarged accumulation of capital and so on. I think this is a formidable catalogue, and 
it speaks a lot well, for Marxian <laughs> theory. <laughs> well, I don't want to get into a political argument. I'd love to do that, as Why a matter not? of fact. But, well, the purpose of this programme is to elicit your views on a, on a <laughs> further range of topics. But I can't let what you've said just pass like that. I mean, to take only the first two of your list, um, you said that there's been increasing concentration of economic power, but surely through the invention of the joint stock company, the ownership of capital has been more widely dispersed than ever before. You talk about the convergence of economic and political power. I would say yes, but what has happened in the West at least is that the decisive control over the economy has passed into the hands of elected politicians who in the democracies are directly elected by the mass of the people and they take the basic economic decisions in the society. Well, you know that with your first uh, statement about the joint stock companies, you express uh, one of the main concepts of Marxist revisionism, introduced first by Engels himself. Uh, they considered the joint stock companies with a dispersed ownership already as preforms of a socialist society. Now we know today that this is obviously wrong, and you will not maintain that, for example, in the great multinational corporations, the stockholders uh, control the policy, national and global, of these corporations. It is not the ownership alone uh, that matters, but the control of the productive forces, which is decisive. As far as the state is concerned and the role of the politicians, do you believe that the politicians make their decisions entirely by themselves as free individuals, or uh, isn't there some kind of link between the policy makers and the great economic powers in the society? Well, the politicians certainly aren't dominated by the great economic powers, but anyway, I think I will have to let that pass reluctantly and get back to the, the Frankfurt School. We've talked in general terms and I, uh, about the Frankfurt School. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I mentioned two or three of the individuals in my opening remarks, but I think it would be especially interesting to hear just a word from you about who the main individuals were and what they were like, because after all they were your close friends and associates. Well, uh, Horkheimer was the director of the Institute. He was not only a uh, thoroughly trained, a knowledgeable philosopher and sociologist, uh, but also, uh, in a strange sense, a uh, financial wizard who could take care very well of uh, the uh, material basis, as it were, of the Institute, not only in Germany, but also afterwards in the United States. A brilliant man, and uh, nothing that was written in the uh, periodical ins of the Institute and afterwards was written without previous discussion with him and with the other uh, collaborators uh, at the Institute. Adorno, uh, a genius. I have to call him a genius uh, because I have never seen anyone who was, uh, as you already mentioned, uh, so equally well at home in philosophy, sociology, uh, psychology, music, uh, whatever it may be. It was absolutely amazing. He, uh, when he talked, uh, it could be printed without any change. <laughs> it was perfectly uh, uh, ready uh, for print. Then uh, are those who are uh, unjustly neglected or forgotten. Uh, Leo Lontal, the literary critic of the Institute, uh, Franz Neumann, a, a brilliant legal philosopher, Otto Kirchheimer, equally uh, well uh, familiar in legal philosophy, uh, Frederick Pollock, and uh, especially uh, Hendrik Grossmann, the most orthodox of all Marxist economists I have ever met. He uh, predicted uh, the collapse of capitalism for a very specific year he gave. In the meantime, it turned out it wasn't quite correct. <laughs> Uh, like, like the medieval churchman predicting the end of the exactly, world. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, Pollock, who after all wrote, I think, the first article in which he tried to argue that uh, there are no compelling internal reasons why capitalism should collapse. Now, one of the 
uh, things that you all as a group pioneered uh, in the perhaps late 20s and certainly early 30s was the shift of interest in Marxist studies back from the works of the mature Marx to the works of the earlier Marx, the things he wrote when he was more directly under the influence of Hegel. And one of the things, one of the many things, I think, that came out of that, which has been of continuing influence ever since, is the, uh, an interest in the notion of alienation. I think alienation, in its modern sense, was coined by Hegel taken up and given a new significance by Marx, and then almost, you can say, fell out of Western thought for nearly a hundred years. And you, plural, were instrumental in bringing it back, weren't you? It would be very interesting to hear your comments on the importance of this idea. Well, that's a very complicated story. According to Marx, uh, alienation was a socio-economic concept. And uh, it meant, basically, this is a very uh, brutal, brutal abbreviation, that uh, under capitalism, uh, men and women could not, in their work, fulfill their own individual humane faculties and needs. That this was due to the capitalist mode of production itself and could only be remedied by radically changing this mode of production. Now today, uh, the concept of alienation has been expanded and extended uh, to such an extent that this original uh, content is uh, almost entirely uh, lost. An extension all too easy, uh, which I consider uh, not only uh, premature, but also wrong, uh, because, uh, for example, uh, not every kind of uh, trouble or problem someone has with his girlfriend or the boyfriend is necessarily due to the capitalist mode of production. <laughs> In other words, you think that the idea has been trivialized? Trivialized, and it uh, very needs to be restored. Yes, and that it's in, a, in its original significance, it is of fundamental importance. Fundamental importance. Yes. Yes. We've talked up to this point in our discussion in rather negative terms. We've talked about what the Frankfurt School was against. We've talked about its critique of Marxism and at least by implication its, its critique of the capitalist system. Uh, what was its positive contribution? Well, I would say to start with the easiest one, uh, one of uh, its decisive uh, positive contributions was a prediction of fascism uh, long before it actually happened. Uh, uh, secondly, uh, what uh, Horkheimer himself considered as a distinguishing characteristic, the interdisciplinary uh, approach uh, to the great social and uh, political problems of uh, the time, uh, cutting across the academic division of labor, applying sociology, psychology, philosophy, to the uh, understanding and developing of uh, the uh, problems of the uh, time. And in my view, uh, the most interesting contribution, the uh, attempt to answer the question, what actually has gone wrong in Western civilization, that at the very height of uh, technical progress, we see at the same time uh, the opposite as far as human progress is concerned. Dehumanization, brutalization, uh, the torture again as normal means of interrogation, uh, the uh, wasteful development of nuclear energy, destructiveness everywhere and so on. How has this happened? And uh, he, especially Horkheimer, but also the others went back into uh, not only a social but also intellectual history and tried uh, to uh, define the interplay between progressive and repressive categories throughout the intellectual history of the West, especially in the Enlightenment, for example, which is usually considered as one of the most progressive uh, phases in history. And uh, the Frankfurt School pointed out to what extent this uh, apparently uh, perfectly clear progressiveness, this liberating tendency was at the same time tied up with regressive and repressive tendencies. This uh, 
picture that you paint of a group of Marxists um, almost obsessed with the question, what has gone wrong, suggests to me a, a, a politics of disillusionment. I mean, there seems to be an aura about it of disappointed hopes, disappointment with a Marxist theory, disappointment perhaps even with the working class itself for failing to be an effective instrument of revolution. Was there something disappointed or disillusioned or pessimistic at the centre of your approach in those days? Well, if a disappointment means, as you formulated, disappointment with the working class, I would decidedly reject it. Uh, none of us has a right uh, to blame the working class for what it is doing or what it is not doing. So this kind of uh, disappointment, certainly not. Uh, there was indeed another disappointment, and that seems to me a very objective uh, attitude. Uh, I mentioned it before, namely that uh, the uh, incredible social wealth that had been assembled in Western civilization, and mainly as the achievement of capitalism, was increasingly used for destroying rather than constructing a, a more decent and humane society. If you call that disappointment, yes, but I think it's a very uh, justified and objective disappointment. And, and you saw your central task as being an investigation of the reasons as to why that was exactly. so. Exactly. How had it come about? So the essential uh, um, enterprise of the Frankfurt School was a critical one. Definitely. Yes. Therefore, critical the term critical theory today yes. for uh, the... Uh, writings of the Frankfurt yes. School. One thing that the members of the Frankfurt School uh, exhibited very considerable concern with from the beginning was aesthetics. And this, I think, differentiates it from most other philosophies, certainly from most other political philosophies. And you yourself have written a lot in recent years about aesthetic matters. Why did you and your colleagues always regard aesthetics as so important? Well, I believe, and it was Adorno who is, uh, to whom I'm closest in this respect, I believe that in art, literature, and music, uh, insights and truth are uh, expressed, which cannot be communicated in ordinary language, uh, let's say in prose uh, for brevity's uh, sake, and that with these truths, uh, images, the image of an entirely new dimension is opened, uh, which is either repressed or tabooed in uh, reality. Namely, uh, the image of a uh, human existence and of nature no longer confined within the norms of a repressive reality principle, but uh, really uh, striving for their fulfillment and uh, gratification, even at the price of death and uh, catastrophe. I try to uh, illustrate it by uh, saying that uh, the match, uh, well, uh, let me use a terrible word, the message of art and literature is uh, that actually the world should be experienced uh, so as the lovers of all times experienced it as uh, King Lear experienced it, as Anthony and Cleopatra experienced it. In other words, a rupture with the established reality principle, at the same time the invocation of the images of liberation. In other words, what you're saying now ties up with what you were saying very near the beginning of our discussion about uh, your insistence that socialism should be dis concerned with a different quality of life exactly. and not only with material exactly. matters. And that means that you, at least, see uh, literature as a repository of new values and you don't just see it as, a, as, a, as a, a critique of existing society or a revolutionary instrument in the way that many Marxist uh, critics, literary critics... I would do. say it is all authentic literature is both. It is on the one hand accusation of the existing society, uh, but on the other hand, and internally linked to it, always the images of uh, liberation. I certainly do not believe that you can give any adequate explanation of a literary work simply in terms of the class struggle or whatever it may be. 
Well, this is a field in which uh, thinkers in the tradition of the Frankfurt School, like yourself, are now doing fresh and original work. What other areas do you think the, uh, this school of philosophy, this tradition of philosophy, is going to have to concern itself with in the immediate future? Well, I can in this respect only talk of myself. And I would say that uh, far more attention should be paid to the women's liberation movement. I see in the women's liberation movement today a, a very strong radical uh, potential. Now, I would have to give a lecture in order to explain do why I do that. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. I, I cannot. Uh, let me at least try to say it in uh, two uh, sentences. Uh, all domination in recorded history up to today was patriarchal domination. So if uh, we should indeed live to see not only a, a equality of uh, the woman before the law or whatever it is, but uh, the uh, deployment of uh, what is called the specific feminine qualities throughout the society. For example, non-violence, receptivity, tenderness. This would indeed be, or perhaps could be, the beginning of a qualitatively different society, the very antithesis to uh, male domination uh, with its violent and brutal character. Now, I'm uh, myself perfectly uh, conscious of the fact that these so-called specific feminine qualities are socially conditioned. I was and, going to say, uh, there are people who would regard it as sexist to say that all they right. are now, specifically they feminine are, I don't qualities. care. They are socially yes. conditioned, but to a great extent they are available. They are there. So yeah. why not use them the way they are, yeah. regardless of the question as to their origin? I'd like to end our discussion, Professor Marcuse, by putting to you one or two of the main criticisms that are commonly made of your work. Um, I've really put the chief one to you already, and that was a long way back in the discussion when I said to you, given your awareness of so many things wrong with Marxism, why do you remain a Marxist? I won't put that to you again because you've already indicated what your because reply is. Because I think it's correct. Yes, yes. <laughs> but, but there are others too. Um, uh, for example, it's commonly said of the new left movement that has developed uh, to such a large degree out of your work that, um, that it is elitist, that you have these, these little groups of, for the most part, middle class and uh, some would say self-admiring intellectuals divorced from the working class, as you yourself acknowledged earlier, regarding themselves as the instruments of revolution. Um, and that the whole thing has become trendy, has become fashionable, and above all has become dissociated with the real uh, uh, working class that it was all supposed originally to be about. Well, the term elitist I would reject entirely. Uh, I think it is uh, another expression of the self-inflicted masochism among the new left. Uh, it isn't an elitism. Uh, what we have are simply uh, groups, which I would like to call catalyst groups, uh, which, uh, because of the privilege of their education and training, uh, indeed uh, develop uh, intelligence, theory, uh, as remote from the material process of production. That cannot be uh, remedied uh, by any uh, dictum, uh, this can be remedied only in the process of change itself. Now, I have never maintained that these catalyst groups could ever replace the working class as subjects and agents of the revolution. Uh, they are educational groups, mainly political, but not only political education. Their main task is the development of consciousness, trying to counteract the management and control of consciousness by the established power structure, and so on. But they are certainly not a substitute for uh, the uh, working class itself. Now, the second point you brought up, the language. Uh, to a great extent, now, I this agree. Was, if I may, may uh, stop you here, Professor Marcuse, this was something I said to you 
before we went on the air to tape this program. So let me say it again so that the viewers will know. I, this was something that I was saying in criticism of you when we were talking earlier. Uh, what I said then, and I'll repeat it now, is that uh, I think something that may sound like a trivial criticism but is not trivial is that so many of the writings of the Frankfurt School are in fact very, very difficult to read. Worse than that, they're turgid, sometimes unintelligible. I exempt, and I do it sincerely, yours from this. Uh, your writings they're bad are not, enough. Your writings, but your writings, Adorno, for example. Earlier in this discussion, you described Adorno as a genius. Now, I find some Adorno literally unreadable. Now, that seems to me to constitute an enormous barrier between the ideas you were trying to disseminate and the public you were trying to disseminate them to. And this is a serious criticism. And if anything, it's, in, it, it, it's made uh, greater by the fact that other alternative philosophies are often expanded by writers who are very good writers. For example, uh, in, the, in the analytic tradition, there's almost, there is almost a tradition of wit and verve. I mean, Bertrand Russell won the Nobel Prize for Literature. So incidentally did Jean-Paul Sartre, probably the leading exponent of existentialism. So when one reads existentialism or analytic philosophy... You conceded has, Heidegger. Well, I, didn't, I deliberately didn't mention <laughs> yes, Heidegger because he doesn't fit my thesis. Exactly. But nevertheless, I think it is fair to say that the Frankfurt, the writings of the Frankfurt School as a whole, are extraordinarily turgid. Now, why was that? Why is it? Well, to a great extent, to some extent, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. And I confess that there are many things in Adorno I don't understand. Uh, I want at least to say one word about his justification. It was that ordinary language, ordinary prose, even a little sophisticated, has been uh, so much permeated by the establishment, uh, by the uh, express so much the controls and the manipulation of the individual by the power structure, that already in the language you use, you have to indicate the rupture with conformity. Therefore, the attempt to convey this rupture already in the syntax, in the grammar, in the vocabulary, whatever it may be. Now, whether or not that is acceptable, I don't know. Uh, the only thing I would say, there is an equally great danger in the uh, premature popularization of the uh, terribly complex problems uh, we face today. We're, we've reached the end of our discussion now, Professor Marcuse, but. To close, I would like to put a personal question to you, and I do it because you've had an experience in life which must have happened to remarkably few human beings in history. You spent almost a whole lifetime as an academic known uh, to a comparatively small circle, your pupils, the readership of uh, the rather specialized readership of your books and articles. And then suddenly, when you were literally nearly 70, you became almost overnight, one is tempted to say, a world figure. Now, this is an astonishing thing to happen to anyone. What was it like to have it happen to you? Well, on the one hand, I enjoyed it tremendously. On the other hand, I found it somehow uh, not deserved. And uh, I may uh, end, if this is the end, on a rather impertinent note, I, no, it isn't so impertinent. I always said when I was asked, how is that possible? I said, I appear only as such a figure because the others are still more stupid than I am. But no one could ever have expected it, and I suppose you never expected it, did you? No, I certainly didn't. Well, thank you very much, Professor Marcuse.